Hello. This is a recording of a Winter Heritage Open Days event live streamed in 2020. We hope you enjoy it. All of that, Becky, and thank you to everyone who's turned up this evening. Um, I can only hope that I live up to the, the high standards and expectations that uh, Becky has set up here. Uh, and with a talk like the stories behind Winchester's place names, I know I think this is going to be fantastic, and I know that the place names are, are going to be fantastic, but I'm uh, just going to echo the apology that I couldn't possibly get around to every single one that was sent. There was over 50 uh, this time yesterday as I was trying to pick and choose the last final one. So I've I've gone for uh, a little bit of a scattergun approach at the beginning, tried to go for things that seem kind of... Uh, to address some of the most commonly asked for place names. And then I've gone for a couple of case studies of what I think are some of the most uh, edifying place names that we see around in Winchester. So I've put my email on this. So if you have any questions, do feel free to email me, especially if I can't get around to them today. As Becky's flagged up, I also hope to do podcast or write up some of the other ones we couldn't get around to. Um, but before we get into the, the nitty gritty of some of these place names, I'm going to talk about why I couldn't just go through all 50 uh, plus place names that were uh, requested. And that's because of the amount of work that goes into uh, uncovering a place name and the amount of information that's hidden uh, in a place name. So I'm going to use the uh, quote that every onomaster, every name specialist ever has used somewhere in publication or in print, uh, and that's quoting Shakespeare's what's in a name. I'm just going to slightly misappropriate it and say what's in a place name. And they all kind of begin with what seems like it might be a little bit dull. They all begin with descriptive meanings. They all just describe what's there. So we're going to take a look at uh, a curious place name Orem's Arbor, two very unusual words, not very common words in the English language, that describe that place that you might have encountered near Winchester train station. Now it's named after Alexander Orem, who brought the land on a thousand year lease in 1698, and uh, who was a notable merchant. He also erected a, a number of other works around Winchester. But we know that before Alexander Oren bought it, it was just known as the Arbor. So as soon as he bought it on that long lease, his name was affixed to it. Everyone knew it as Oren's Arbor, you know, attributing it to the person. But as time went on and people stopped thinking about the person, it just became this static place name. Now, before Alexander Oren bought it, it was known just as the Arbor. And we see that in documents like wills, like the will of William Burton in 1603. And to get behind this, we see that it was originally just a description of a big flat bit of open grassy land. This is the definition taken from the Oxford English Dictionary that I've just put up on the screen here. So all of these names start off usually with some quite fairly straightforward attribution. And this is why we get a lot of similar elements in place names. So we get a lot of tons in uh, Britain because that was the old word for town and it was just describing some sort of town. And then as time goes on, we kind of lose any recognition of that meaning. So the point that we get things like Orem's Arbor, which maybe uh, some more sagacious individuals out there recognized it immediately. But I had to do a little bit of digging to find out what on earth an Orem's Arbor was. Now, there are a couple of principles of change that happen that inform place names. And they can change really for two main reasons. One, and this is the one that tends to obfuscate place names the most, they might change because of natural sound changes. As a language uh, develops over time, we get people coming up with new ways to pronounce things. Now, it might be that they're shortcutting things uh, like sword, which was originally pronounced as it was spelt, sword, but people realize that the, the R in there is kind of unwieldy after the W. And then the W kind of got unwieldy too. So those all disappear and the word spelt sword became sword. Now, in place names, we see things like the Isle of Wight, was in uh, the earlier forms of English pronounced Isle of 
uh, or Isle of Wichte, uh, where Wicht was an old word meaning human or creature. And we see that mean of that old pronunciation kind of fossilized in the shape of the word. I don't know if you can see my mouse hovering over the screen at the, the GH there, but that was pronounced. And then the G and H fell together and became a H sound. Um, and the I that we see in Wicht became the I sound that we recognize so well. And if some of you know another Germanic language, this explains the difference between fifth in say Icelandic and five in English is that English originally had that weird I sound and then went through these natural sound changes. Now I could talk for days, hours, weeks. I run a module at the university on sound changes, uh, but I will not subject you to that today. Suffice to say, all we'll note for the moment is that sound changes can obfuscate these original meanings. The other thing that can happen is that whole names can be replaced. So there's a little area called Paternoster Row. Hopefully you can see my mouse on the screen just next to the, the car park by the, the cathedral. There's that little indentation there that is now called Paternoster Row, a nice divine name for a, a location that's very close to a divine location. Um, now, it was once upon a time called Shite Lane, up until the latest I could find was the early 16th century. It was called Shite Lane. And this was a very pragmatic description. Uh, Shite Lane and what is now Colebrook Street were part of the, um, should we call it the latrine system in early Winchester? So this is the way that business would flow. And uh, we'll come to the, the fact that coal brook was actually originally a descriptor of the name of the brook, call probably being a word meaning uh, dark, and I'll leave it to your reasoning and imagination why coal brook, which was attached to shite lane, was so dark, and it was a, a very important part of the infrastructure in Winchester. But you might see that it's not particularly great for advertising the cathedral. If you think about place names as signposts in the landscape, next to such a big, majestic, colossal uh, testimony to the wealth and power of the church in medieval England, you couldn't, it wasn't really appropriate to have Shite Lane. So we started getting competing names. And then as we get council sort of establishing official names for places, Paternostero it was, and Shite Lane unfortunately got left to the vestiges of time and memory. Now, with those kind of general truisms for digging through place names out of the way, let's go to why we need to spend a lot of time, why you can't just ask a, a linguist like myself, well, here's the name of a thing today. What did it originally come from? Uh, and these two rather salacious examples do not have salacious beginnings. Bitchfield in Lincolnshire and Bitchfield in Northumberland have to... Uh, I would be justified saying they have the same name today, but they do not come from the same place. And to figure that out, we need to go through local documentation or things like chronicles, uh, and we need to find the first time that this place is described and what the spellings are. We need to see how that changes over time. So Bitchfield in Lincolnshire is first described in old English documents. Uh, but I think the first instance is actually in the Doomsday Book in 1086 as Billers felt, where Billers is quite clearly a personal name. That ES, incidentally, is why we have the apostrophe S today. When you say something like the dog's bowl, that is from the Old English ES ending, meaning it belongs to something. So this was just a field that belonged to a man named Bill. And then little natural sound changes happen over time. And because people, by and large, are a little bit cheeky, uh, Bill's fields became uh, changed into bitch fields. Now, there's a very different story in Northumberland, where we have today the same name, bitch field. But if we look back first in late modern English, where it is still bitch field, somebody clearly thought they were quite funny and slightly altered the name. In early modern English, it was very clearly beach filled, the field with beaches in it. And while we, while we don't have the Old English uh, attestation of it, the first time the name is recorded anywhere, it's in Middle English, 
we have to go back to that earliest instance to see that this bitch field was not named after a man named Bill, but it was named because it was a field that had beaches either in it or framing it, bordering it. So we can't just presume what a place name comes from by looking at the modern evidence. We have to dig back through time. And it's quite a, a painstaking and tedious task to look through local documents or chronicles and firstly try and find these places. And then secondly, make sure that we're describing the right bitch field or describing the right place in a given area. So that's a little bit of background into why it takes so long to discover these place names and uh, hopefully ends a little bit of weight to my apology for not being able to go through all the place names uh, that were offered. Now, interestingly, given that place names tend to be quite descriptive, we do see things like the movement of people and different functions absorbed in it. So let's take a look at Winchester. I'm sure many people in the audience will already know this etymology, but I feel like we can't have a talk about place names at the Winchester Heritage Open Day, uh, Open Festivals without talking about the etymology of Winchester. So if we go back into Old English, we see that there are some competing forms. There was no standardized spelling the uh, further back we go. So we have both Winchester and Wintanchester, which uh, has the word Chester in it. And that is an Old English word that means market town. Uh, sometimes it's affixed to a place like Winchester or Chichester, and sometimes it is not fixed to a place as in, well, Chester. Now, the first word there is really, really interesting because what we're seeing is some reinterpretation over time. So the earlier one must be Wintanchester because it is a borrowing of Latin venter from Venter Belgarum, the, the Roman name for the city, which was Venter, the marketplace of the Belgarum, which in my teaser uh, for this event, I said, what does Winchester have in common with Belgium? Well, they're both named after this Celtic tribe, the Belgars, the Belgarum. So early English speakers, after Roman speakers had largely disappeared from the landscape, kind of knew that this place was called a, a venter, but they needed to qualify it in ways that were meaningful to them as English speakers. So it was the venter chester, and we essentially get the marketplace town, marketplace town as a doubling uh, in the name. And then as the reasons for Wintan being borrowed become less and less clear, people start to folk etymologize. They start to create their own meaning, like we saw for poor old Billsfield uh, in the last slide. And so it became Winchester, probably under the influence of the old English word win, which meant joy or happy. So it went from the market town, market town to a happy market town, which I think nicely describes Winchester on a sunny Sunday. Uh, and not so well describes it on one of those rainy weekend days. Oh, it wasn't a weekend day when we had all the flooding, but it doesn't describe it when the, the floods were, were happening. So I'm going to try and point to some other vestiges of this old English language in and around the city of Winchester. And these are just a, a kind of quick fire way of trying to address some of the many place names that were put forward. So one thing that was asked is why is the soak called the soak? Well, it's kind of a straightforward descriptive meaning. And like many of these descriptive meanings, uh, shows us something about its social usage or its political usage or the usage of the land. So Bill's field was owned by Bill, Orem's arbor was owned by Orem. Uh, the description of the arbor is just because of what the land is. And the soak comes from an old English word, sok, meaning an area under a particular jurisdiction. Now, this was referring probably to the jurisdiction of the bishops, either around uh, what would become the cathedral uh, or Wolvesey Castle. But uh, elsewhere around the country, we get other places called the Soak or Soak, uh, and they are probably under royal jurisdiction. This is quite an unusual Soak for being probably, and we do have to speak quite often in terms of probability when we're dealing with history over a thousand years ago, probably under uh, ecclesiastical jurisdiction. 
Now, Hyde has a similar sort of bureaucratic political underpinning to it, and it comes under from the old English word hid, meaning a measure of land. You might have heard of this word in things like the tribal hydage, which was the great Wessex endeavour to calculate how much money uh, places could uh, feasibly produce. Uh, a hide is sort of the, the unit of land that sustains one family. And hide is so called because it is next to what would have been the Alfredian palace, probably, or, uh, you know, the Alfred castle at Hyde. The residents at Hyde know this very, very well, and I don't, uh, I don't need to go into too much detail about it here. So we've got two sort of legislative uh, social political names so far. Now, Colebrook, again, I've not been able to find the earliest spelling in a way that really distinguishes what word we're looking at, especially when these words are very, very, very similar in all their spellings. Now, it could possibly come from either the Old English or Middle English word for dark, coal, which you also have uh, sort of fossilized in the name of the coal tit, because it's the, the darker of the tits. Um, or it could come from the word call meaning cool. It can be difficult sometimes to distinguish between the two of them. Given its proximity to Shite Lane, however, I think it's probably more likely that the coal brook described a dark brook rather than a cool brook. But maybe somebody who has the time or inclination to go paddling in the coal brook can tell us if it is indeed cool. Now, full flood again has a uh, aquatic etymology to it, where flood is the Old English word for water. It could be any kind of water. It didn't necessarily have to be a flood. It could be a river. It could be a stream. It could be a lake. And it's either an area with foul water or that is full of water. And because of how similar these spellings are, it's very difficult for us to um, recover that by looking at the Old English and Middle English spellings. What would help us is if some thoughtful early medieval scribe had written, it is called full flood because it is full of water or the water there is foul. But it was so self-evident to them that they didn't think it was necessary to distinguish between it. And so us later analysts are left in a rather precarious position of having to weigh up various possibilities. Now, the last one are the worthies, which we see all over the place in this area. And in fact, you see them quite a lot throughout England. This comes from an Old English word, worthy, meaning an enclosed play, uh, bit of land, usually settled. And then the things that come before worthy tend to describe it. So to pluck an example out of the air, uh, headborn worthy was requested. And that's because it was at the hefter or the head, uh, the origins of a Burnan or a stream or a brook. So it's the enclosure that was at the head of a stream. And you can see how that originally descriptive name, the worthy at the head of a burn, became headburn worthy, just became fossilized this way over time as people stopped being able to analyze those different names. So now we're going to get into a couple of the uh, more narrative places, ones where we can really try and get to uh, some sort of story behind them rather than an explanation. And this is for the village of Pitt, which today I've got a, a nice uh, environmental map for that shows us where Pitt is today, but that it's also fairly close to Pitt Down, Little Pitt Down Plantation. And I've chosen this one because it shows quite nicely the topography. I'm sure a lot of people here will know this area quite well. But if you don't, we've got Village Pit, and we've got some very, very sharp inclines. Not so much over here, but just to the north of it, we've got quite a, a sharp incline in a little valley. We've got another similar one next to it. And if you see, we've kind of got a landscape that has fairly, fairly steep inclines, things that go up nearly 30 meters in nearly uh, 500 meters. So quite, quite steady uh, valley shapes. And if we go back over time, we can see that there are a couple of different forms. Uh, in 1639, a Latin charter records that it was 
put or pit. And this is quite neat because it shows us that there are dialectal variants in how people were pronouncing the name, either put or pit. Uh, in the 13th century, we see that it's often fair, uh, we've got the same thing, pet or putter. And then if we go back to the earliest in 1167, it looks like it's putter, but it was in a document written by a Norman scribe. So we actually have to use the pronunciation of Norman French at the time here to see that it was pronounced pitter, um, with that kind of front vowel that in English would be rendered by an I. Now the etymology here is the old English word pit, which could mean a pit, which is how it survives today. But more often in Old English, this word meant a valley. And while that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense if you just look at where the, the village of Pitt is today, it makes a lot more sense if you think about this as a name for the whole area. This was the valley area, the Pitt area. And sometimes you can qualify which pit you're talking about by adding a little suffix to it, like pick down, where down is the Old English word dune, which is sort of a gentle to steep incline. Uh, which really describes that area. If you've been for walks around it, it's sort of valleys with these uh, inclines that are fairly shallow seeming, but not that shallow when you try walking up and down them. So a word that changed meaning rather naturally over time is the reason that pit today doesn't seem to fit with the normal meaning of the word pit. We have to look at what the older meanings of the word pit were. Now, one of the more popular requests we had was about both weak and bare weak. And this is part of a, a series of slides where I actually get to play with some older looking maps, which I was quite happy about. So we'll start with weak. And here we've got uh, the Dutch cartographer Jan Blau's map that shows over here, we've got the West Forest, we've got bare weak. We don't we have the soak over here, uh, but we don't actually have weak, and we'll come to that in a moment. If we look at the oldest spellings for weak, we see that looks like a sort of wicker thing, um, perhaps pronounced wike, but the, the sound change here is a, a, quite a complicated one. The it to I sound change takes place over 700 years, so it could be wiker, it could be weak here. What we can be sure about is that it represents the Old English word witch, which represents a, a farmstead or a village. Now we see this in places like Ipswich, which was the village belonging to a man called Ip, uh, who we don't know very much about. And we get quite a lot of wicks uh, surviving in English place names today. So weak is really just a name for a little village area. Nice and straightforward, and even today it's quite well settled. Bear week is a little bit more unusual. We have to look back in time at these older spellings. Now in the 17th century, it's quite important that we see the spelling here is bear week. It has this little diphthong, this little vowel series that is quite significant. And we'll see why, uh, because it preserves an old English diphthong Bearu meaning forest or grove. So both weak and bear weak come from outside of this forest, a little settled area that perhaps was just known as weak, the settled bit, or could be fully qualified as bear weak, the weak, the witch, the village, the farmstead by the forest over here. Now we've got Another sort of similarly geographically motivated one in the Somborns, where we have Upper Somborn, Little Somborn, and King Somborn, all in fairly quick succession. So here I've got a 16th century map by Christopher Saxton, and you see King Somborn over here. We see Little Somborn over here with the name Somborn Pavua, uh, pa Pava, the Latin one, and then we've got up Somborn, Upper Somborn over here. Now, it's quite important for these ones really to go back to the early spelling because natural sound changes have masked the uh, words that we're looking at here. We also see that the idea of it being little 
isn't so much a sort of hard and fast name of the area as a descriptor, because whether you are describing it in English with little, or you're describing it with the Latin word parva, which means small or little, it was that this was the smaller Somborn, and here is the king's Somborn, and up there is the, the higher up one. And we can see quite clearly that kingas here is the possessive word for a king, so it's something that belonged to a king. Now, why would a king possess something that's close to a little one that has an upper one? Uh, that's not clear from these spellings like sunburn or sunburner or sunburner up here, but it is very clear in a 12th century charter, which is a document that describes the granting of land, that describes this area as Kinga's Swinburnan, as the place where uh, we, a Burnan, as we've described earlier, is a brook or a river, and you can see quite clearly the brook and river going up here from King Somborn and Little Somborn. But a Swinburnan was a stream where you could have pigs go. And so it's only by going to that very, very early spelling in the 12th century that we can really decode that Somborn hides these two words, Swin and Berna, a swine stream, a place where the king's pigs can go and drink water. Now, perhaps some of the more skeptical of you uh, are thinking, well, that's all well and good for the King Somborn over here. We see water. And then we've got little Somborn here. Maybe we can justify that being next to water. But in Christopher Saxon's map, Upper Somborn has nothing of the sort. Well, depending on the cartographer, we get different bits of information. So we can never just look at one map. They had different things they were prioritizing in their various maps. And Christopher, Christopher Saxton didn't care too much about waterways. He cared much more about place names, land usage, and as you can tell from the little buildings, the sorts of things that you might find in the landscape. He was mostly recording ecclesiastical centers, so things like churches and bishoprics. Now, Johan Blau, the Dutch cartographer we've already looked at a map from, he cared a lot more about waterways, as was evidenced in his later career of working for the East India Company and mapping out the waterway networks between Europe uh, and India. And he traces not only this stream that goes from King Somborn up Little Somborn all the way to Upper Somborn, but you can see the glorious detail with which he's illustrated these streams over here that Saxton really didn't care very much about. So it's not just a case of going back to the earliest sources, but we have to look at intermediate sources along the way because they might record things in more information than uh, later sources or earlier sources might not care so much about the relevant information. These also both collectively show that there are quite important waterways, which to walk through the Somburns today, you might not recognize given how small the burns are. But that's the beauty of place names. It tells us not only about these geographical features that might be lost, but it tells us that these things were important enough in the landscape that older landscape users had to have them articulated. Now, just a, a couple more place names, I think. I'll try and squeeze those in and then have some time, hopefully, for some uh, questions via the Q&A. So we've had the wallops as well, where we've got over wallop, middle wallop, and nether wallop. And this was asked in, well, what on earth is a wallop? And why do you need an over one, a middle one, and, as crude as it sounds, a nether wallop? Well, as we look back through the spellings, we see that, again, these qualifiers of over, middle, and nether were descriptors. They weren't seen as hard and fast names of the place. So over wallop, at various points, has been called upper wallop or the up wallop, the bit at the top, or over wallop. Or I love this uh, French text that calls, calls it wallop supérieur, the, the superior wallop in the sense of higher rather than, I guess, innately superior. And middle wallop seems to have been quite a late invention as the bit of wallop that's in between upper wallop or over wallop and nether wallop or low wallop 
or to that wonderful French naming wallop inferior, the inferior wallop. So this whole area was called wallop, and then we had it divided over time into the, the upper or the over bit, the nether or the lower bit, and then the middle bit. But I guess that hasn't really addressed the most interesting thing here, which is what on earth is a wallop? And you'll see an explanation offered quite a lot, sometimes in very prestigious sources, that it represents two Old English words put together of well and hop. Now these are Old English words, and these are Old English words that do have a significant degree of place name currency, so they're used for lots of place names around the country. So well meant not only a well, but a stream. It was anywhere you could get your drinkable or usable water from. And then the wells we think of today with the sort of brickwork and the little bucket that goes down the middle, that's a sort of very specific type of well. That's the best type of well, but it's not the only type of well. Now this word hop is really quite unusual and it really only occurs in Old English in, in the uh, compound word merhop, which means uh, a raised bit of land in the middle of a marsh, a mer. Uh, and mares in Old English were a, a bad place. Uh, rife with superstition, if you know the text Beowulf, the monster Grendel lives in a mare, and then we get quite a lot of monstrous mare names throughout Old English charter documents. So when they're describing land, you get things like a Dracus mare, the mare where dragons live. Now, if we take a look at these earlier maps, like Johan Blau's one, okay, we have very clearly, uh, a body of water. But people who live there today might be able to tell me otherwise. But from visiting it, it doesn't seem to be very marshy or fenny or wasty or unusable. And hop had to be a raised bit of land. So I don't see how it can be a well hop, how it can be a raised bit of land in the middle of a marsh or fen when there isn't a marsh or fen here. I also don't see how it can be the stream that's raised in the, uh, uh, on a hop when actually the stream is in the, the lower bits of land. And if you go to the wallops today, they're all quite level. So this is a case where actually we need to go back further. We can't just stop at Old English. We need to look back at earlier documents. This might have been spelt wallop for folk etymological reasons, for the same reasons that people hear a name and then they try and make it out of words that they better understand, like we saw happened already with Wintanchester to Winchester. Now, in a very early source in the ninth century, uh, British historian called Nennius writing the Historia Britonum, which is sort of a, an account of the kings and the battles in Britain. Uh, he describes a battle between these uh, mythological figures, Vortigern and Ambrosius Aurel Aurelianus. Uh, and he says that this happened at Gualopum id est cat Gualop. Now what he's doing here is he's producing the name of somewhere that happens, and it's around this bit of the country, that in Latin is Gualopum, but he clearly knows what it is in Welsh, and he says that is id est, cat Gualop. Cat means battle, so that is the, gattle, uh, the battle at Gualop. And this Gua thing is quite interesting. Um, you know how French speakers speaking English today, when they're uh, pronouncing words like the or this or that in very quick succession where they're not uh, paying too much attention, they default to a, a sound in that's very common in French of ce. And they'll say this and that, for example. Now, this is the same thing that's happening here. We've got a Welsh speaker who doesn't like the wa sound. He's gone for this gwa sound. And we see quite often in uh, words borrowed between English and Welsh in this period, like uh, in Welsh, there's a special kind of uh, side, uh, it's a, a special sort of ale, actually, that's called gwirod. And it's borrowed into English as wered, where in Welsh it starts with gwa, in English it starts with wa. We see the same thing happening the other way. There's a, a sort of falcon called uh, well in Old English, or the well uh the peregrine falcon, that into Welsh is borrowed as wal, with a gwa at the beginning. So he's saying that this place, Wallop, 
is known as Cadwallop, and it's quite a famous place that's commemorated from the fifth century. So even though we have dubious reasons for thinking that there actually was a man called Vortigern, his name means big tyrant in uh, Brythonic, and I don't know who'd want to name their child big tyrant. Maybe some of you with uh, toddlers will understand why you'd call someone big tyrant, but historians are generally dubious about Vortigern being a real person. So even though these uh, personages are quite dubious, there seems to be a sort of long-lasting memory of this place that is pre-English. And having gone through quite an interesting journey to get as far back as Nennius and find that it was named by the people who were here even before the Romans, the Brythonic speakers, and then it's gone through the uh, various uh, sieves of being spoken by Latin speakers and then English speakers, uh, we can't actually offer you an etymology for this because we don't know what this word would mean in Brythonic. We can just say that it is Brythonic. So I like to think that sometimes it's the importance of the journey rather than where you end up, but I know not everyone feels the same way. So we're going to look at another Brythonic name where we can be a little bit more sure about where it comes from. So just to show that Brythonic names are fairly common in this area, we've got good old Mitchell Dever, which uh, I quite like the, 15th, uh, the 16th century spelling rather, the, the 1500 spelling of Mitchell Dever, because it's almost like it's a, a bloke's name, like Old Mitchell. Um, and then we've got these older ones, Mitchell Dever, which are, again, this folk etymology I've spoken about already. There is a word mickle or mutchel in Middle English that just meant much. So if you've seen somewhere like Micklewood, um, that just means the big wood. So this was just the big deva. And we see even in Old English, it was understood as Mitchell deva. Now there's a 12th century source. Uh, this is a forged charter. It's a forgery that proclaims to be a ninth century source, but it was forged in the 12th century. And the interesting thing about forgeries in charters is that uh, the forgers were quite good. They tended to use real extant documents and they tended to try and copy the handwriting, just not, not well enough for experts to not see past it. Uh, and this forgery records the name as Mickendefer, which is really interesting because both of those things have meanings in Brythonic, probably, and we see another example of folk etymology where all English speakers faced with this kind of senseless word tried to make it into English. So they replace this old word miken with mikkel, and then through a natural series of sound changes that becomes Mitchell, which is where we get Mitchell Dever from today. So we've got two possible etymologies here. One, if the Old English spelling is right and the forgers were making things up, then it comes from the Old English Mitchell, big, and this Old Brythonic word divir, which means water. And we get that best pro, uh, preserved in the name Dover, uh, which just comes from Dover, meaning water, but also in the river name the, the Dur in Kent. Now, if the forgery was using a document that is now lost that was originally 9th century and it was just trying to replace this 9th century document. Say the forger had a 9th century document in front of them, copied it and then burnt it to get rid of the old evidence. Then we're faced with the possibility that we've actually got a Brythonic name in both parts, meaning Mihen Diver, the marshy area, the muddy area around the water. And if we take a look at the topography of Mitchell Dever, it makes a regional amounts of sense. We've got the river up here, and then we've got quite wet land. It's been drained a lot in the intervening centuries. But uh, looking at historical maps, it's quite clear that this area is quite marshy and that the settlement was a settlement on quite muddy water. We get also uh, settlement names like this quite a lot too. And I, well, I wanted to sort of finish uh, detailed explorations of place names on this because it shows how we have this sort of succession of speakers and how it's not just speakers today folk etymologizing, but it's speakers throughout time have been handed weird names that they didn't quite understand and they had to adapt it to make sense in their own language. So place names, just to sort of 
give a summary to the various stories we've seen tend to be fossils of a historical moment. But those earlier historical moments aren't fossilized. They are interpreted and they are reinterpreted. We see that while they can be descriptive of landscape or landscape's function, what they really tell us about is how people were using places and how people were reusing places throughout the ages. Uh, so I want to wrap up there, actually, so that we've got a little bit of time to do a Q&A in the chat. So if, if anyone's got any pressing questions, I will do my best to answer them. But with the little provisio that I can't right now go through centuries and centuries of documents, and often they will just be the best guess based on a spelling. <laughs> Eric, just so you know, we had one right at the start from Jennifer about Blue Boar Hill. Ooh. And you'll also find um, it's currently under answered in the Q&A. And we've also had Adam, who you'll find it in the chat, who's put a little bit of a challenge out there about the bollocks and the fens. Um, oh. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide which you'll do. I'll put myself back on mute now. All right, I'll start with the, uh, the Q&A because I haven't got the chat up in front of me, but I do have the Q&A up in front of me. Uh, now, this is a conundrum. Actually, and it's one where I didn't manage to locate early enough documents to uh, answer this in the presentation. I did try and take a look for this. Um, this is a nice example of where we have reinterpretation, right? Blue ball or blue boar. Uh, you have people only in a pre-literate society, you just have people going by the names of these places. So uh, what is first blue ball or blue boar? I would suspect that it's Blue Ball Hill and that ball actually encodes an earlier word like ball, which means um, a place that is sloping and has trees on it, but I couldn't find anything early enough to suggest it. It's still very interesting to see that it was folk etymologized as Blue Boar in probably a pre-literate age. Now, I see Mara's put something about hair stock into uh, the q and I will get to that in a second. What I'll try and do first is see if I can um, find, I can't actually see the chat anywhere. Okay, do you want me to read it out? Because I, I know that not everybody can see it. So what Adam has asked is, the wallop brook runs through the wallops. There is certainly lower lying marshy land, often subject to flooding in heavy rain. Ah, now that is, so this is, again, I think this is what people like um, Oscroft, you might have seen this fantastic book, Place Names of Hampshire by Alfred Oscroft, who endorses this idea of a well hop. Now, unfortunately, for it to make sense in Old English, the brook would have to run not through these lower lying marshy lands, but from the top of it and along the hop. The hop is kind of, as the second element, it's the thing that's being described. So how do we have a hop that has a well in or on it? Well, it has to be the higher ground that has the, the stream through it. So while there is the, the topography, like we saw in the map with the streams and these like higher and lower areas, uh, it doesn't make sense according to the rules of compounding in Old English. Uh, but, you know, th there is a discussion to be had, and you might find some toponymists, some people who study place names, who want to indulge in that sort of uh, reasoning. I don't find it convincing based on what I've seen from the other hops in the UK, which all have the feature described on top of that hop, on top of that raised bit of ground. That's fascinating. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I will let you now do the Q&A because we have two about hair stock. And Adam's also said that's really interesting. Thanks. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, I'm glad to know that uh, it's my, my reasoning's remotely convincing to some people. Now, hair stock, I have to apologize to both Mara and Wendy, is not one that I had time to look into. Now, uh, is there a story about this being a place where heads were put on stakes? Is that, is that true? Is there a, I've, I've not heard this. 
I have heard that, but this isn't in Hairstock. I did hear at the top of the hill as you're coming up Andover Road and approaching Berwick Road, that was where the gibbet used to be. But now, I hadn't heard about stakes and hairstock. <laughs> we have a number of uh, places named after gibbets, um, usually crossroads. Uh, but also sometimes these liminal areas that they wanted to display gibbets on so that people who are traveling between cities would have to see uh, what happens to criminals. But I'm not sure, and I'm not an archeologist, so I, you know, I, I'm not qualified to speak at all about whether there was or was not um, something there. I'm just trying to look through a dic uh, dictionary in front of me, not so much to, engage in their argumentation, but see if they've got some of the earlier spellings. Now, I've got right in front of me uh, this lovely but really unaffordable Cambridge Dictionary by Victor Watts, which had nothing of the sort. So I'm going to have to go to Oscroft, who uh, it's a beautiful book, but his uh, etymologies are sometimes questionable, and he was writing quite a long time ago. I'm just going into it, however, to see if he has any of its early spellings, because that's just what would clinch it for me. There are a couple of things he doesn't seem to have it at all, unfortunately. Uh, there are a couple of things that become stock in um, present day English. Now, one is uh, Stitcher, which unfortunately is just an Old English name, meaning uh, a place. Uh, you get a nice Middle English which means here and there, as, as a nice little rhyming pair. So the stock could come from this old stitcher. It could also come from uh, stock, as in somewhere that uh, livestock were kept, as a place where things were stored. Um, whether it could come from a stake in this part of the country, I'm not sure is a normal sound change. But given that there's quite a lot going on in the chat there, I think this is one of the ones I'll have to go away and look into uh, and see what the earlier evidence is. Somebody says, I think there was an Anglo-Saxon cemetery there and stakes were put as warnings. What I do know about Anglo-Saxon cemeteries is that they um, didn't tend to if it was a cemetery, it usually wasn't a place that you then had um, uh, warnings put up. Uh, Andrew Reynolds has written a fantastic book on Anglo-Saxon cemeteries where he points out that you tend to have two different sorts of cemeteries. You tend to have uh, regular cemeteries and then what are called deviant cemetery sites. And deviant cemetery sites are the places where they tend to do things like uh, have public executions and then bury people with their skulls beneath their feet as a way of either shaming them or denying them a way to pass on into the afterlife. Now, I will look into Hairstock and I will commit to doing either a follow-up podcast or an article on it, because this really does depend a lot on what the early spellings say and what the land use was. And I'm afraid I don't know that off the top of my head. <laughs> have a chat with Andrew. You know, as I knew him from uh, quite well from the time we spent at UCL together, so I might, might ping him an email and see if he's got any thoughts on this too. So uh, as unsatisfactory as it is, that will have to be a, uh, let's see what we've got down the line for hair stock. But if anyone else has got any other bits in the Q&A, and I'll also try and take a little peek in the chat, I'll take a look there too. You've got Teg Down in the Q and A. Um, what is the origin of the name of Teg Down? What is the origin of the name Teg Down? Now, Teg is unusual. Uh, it might be the name of a landowner, but Dune tends to be named after a topographical feature that's nearby. I cannot think of anything off the top of my head in Old English that would become Teg today. So I can put this on to-do list if that would be satisfactory and I can try and take a little peek and see if um, there's some Old English evidence there. I see Mara has said, Andrew Reynolds has something to say about, ooh, well I hope to 
to bring that to the fore. If Andrew Reynolds has an explanation for it, it's usually quite a good sign. I trust what Andrew has to say. Uh, looking at them now, I, I think the only one we have got is about, you know, the cemetery and about the stake. So, um, oh, a couple of people have said Teg is about a female sheep. Is a you? Teg is a you. Uh, it, there might be an unusual, uh, uh, either a dialect word or a, uh, a specific word. It's not a word that I recognise from quite a long time of doing Old English. But, you know, the, the thing about these place name elements is that it often don't represent the same sort of vocabulary that you find in literary sources. So there might be evidence for that. I will uh, go away and double check what a tag might be. Brilliant. Lovely. Uh, I don't think we have, we don't have any others. We've just had a few, just a few more people commenting about um, that the tag is a sheep um, and about Ando the road being where the heads used to be put on the stakes. So you've obviously got more research to do for us, yeah, Eric. Gladly, very <laughs> gladly. Uh, oh, Twyford. Clyde has just asked about Twyford. Now, this one I probably can answer off the top of my head. It's a pattern that we get quite a lot across the country where Twy represents, you know, that same sound shift we see from um, Thief to Fife that I described earlier, uh, or Wich to White. This is the same one that we get in Twy and Twy, where it would have been the joining of two fords. Martyr Worthy. Now, this is a little bit later than the sort of stuff I look into. There seems to have been a concerted effort, and I can't put my finger on exactly when, but there seems to have been a concerted effort to try and uh, name things in and around Winchester after saints and the like. So St. Giles Hill, St. Catherine's Hill, Martyr Worthy. Now, whether Martyr Worthy had an earlier name, I'd love to look into uh, and find out because the Worthy bit's quite clearly um, one of those enclosures. But I think the Martyr bit is a later addition. I think there's an Anglo-Saxon teachy meaning small, so Tichburn got its yes. Uh, is small stream not goat stream? Um, I'm not sure where we got uh, goat stream from. Is that perhaps a conversation I didn't see in the chats? Um, there is possibly a teachy meaning small that is attested. There, uh, there is something there. I'd have to look into it to double check. Now, yeah, uh, there's lots of interest to what's about teg meaning sheep in its second year. This is where I, I'll repeat my warning earlier that we have to take a look at words as they were spelt originally and um, what the older names were. Because if we say that teg means according to some people later uh, a sheep in its second year, then the bitch fields that we saw in Lincolnshire, uh, and there's another one that I've forgotten about, would mean fields to do with a female dog rather than a field belonging to Bill or a, a field that had beaches in it. So I'd have to take a look at the antique, how old is the word teg for a, a sheep? And did it have currency in this part of the country at the time when teg down is first recorded as a name? That's what I'd want to look at in order to really satisfactorily answer that question. Okay, that seems to have answered all of the immediate questions. I have noticed some in our audience have had to run to other meetings and have gone on for the rest of their evening. So um, really over to you, Eric, if there's anything else you want to say at the end. Ooh. It's just been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm, I'm only glad that I've, I've picked, uh, the ones that I picked today were the ones that I thought were the most interesting, especially about movements of people. But I'll just repeat that I've popped my email at the start of this. I will trundle back through the presentation so that if people do have particular queries, I'd only be happy to look into them uh, whenever I can. 
Uh, and that I will look up tag or something to do with sheep. There seems to be some discussion about um, Tichborn and uh, tag down whether Tichborn has goat stream. I'll look into it on sound, uh, on just my linguistic knowledge. I'd be more inclined for Tichborn to mean little stream because I don't know how we get from g to ch via standard sound changes. But uh, tag down definitely warrants some pursuing as to what a tag is and whether we have these folk etymologizing uh, processes happening there. Is it that there is an early word that some uh, farmers who know the word tag meaning sheep then reinterpreted to be that? Uh, as it's seven o'clock I am just mindful of people's times and uh, you know it's best to end things with people wanting more rather than have it tarry on for too long. But please, please do, for those who have got some other names in the chat, please do drop me an email. And for any that are requested a lot, I will put together a podcast or uh, a recorded talk on it for these extra names. Or I can always just drop you a quick email with what I find.